Hi, um, my name is Carly Salili, and I'm making this video. This is a special message to all LGBTQ people out there, okay? God has put this message on my heart for months, and I have neglected to speak it, and I have... <laughs> it's just some things that are hard for me to say, but I'm at the point now where I just, I have to say them. I think the time is short. He's coming back soon. And, he wants you to know something, okay? He really wants you to know something. Now, um, give you a little bit of background on me. I am not a prophet, not a prophetess. Um, God does not speak to me in an audible voice or even, even words like most people get. I don't have gifts like word of knowledge or word of uh, discerning of spirits. I, I don't, I'm actually very ditzy. <laughs> I'm kind of a spiritual airhead. You know, God uses me, but he uses me You'll know that it's God and it wasn't me, okay? If God speaks to you in this video, He uses me because I'm weak. Because I'm not the sharpest tool in His shed. And I'm not the brightest. And so He shows that, you know, He works on an earthen clay vessel. But it's His power and not mine. And so tonight it's His love speaking to you and calling you and, and not mine, okay? Um, so, I'm not claiming to be a prophet, but... I am what some people call an empath or what some personality tests call a feeler. My language is feelings and emotions, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it gives me away with animals and helps me, makes me sensitive to other people's feelings. And that's how me and God communicate. When we have intimacy and fellowship, we'll talk for hours. And that's how we communicate, okay? And um, so the words that I pick are my own, all right? And I may not pick the best words and I apologize. That's my humanity, that's, that's my ditziness, that's my airheadedness getting in the way, and I'm sorry. But please be patient. If God drew you to this video, He has a message for you. He wants you to know something. So how God does speak to me is feelings, and the feeling He has put in, in my heart for you, LGBTQ person, is one of overwhelming love. Okay? He's reaching out to you with utter, complete love. He loves you so much. You know, the Bible says, he's the stone the builders rejected, okay? And, and they cast him out. They threw him away. They rejected him. And yet he became the chief cornerstone. So I want you to understand that Jesus himself, he knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be an outcast, to be a misfit. And I know a lot of you know that feeling. You know, I walk with you and I talk with you daily. And I know that, that you're no stranger to that feeling. And I want you to know that Jesus is no stranger to that feeling either. And that there is a very tender, compassionate, merciful, loving part of his heart that is literally breaking for you. He wants you to come home. He is LGBTQ person. He is calling you. He is calling you as his prodigal daughter, as his prodigal son to come home. He wants to put his arms around you and just hold you. There's an empty place inside you. You tried to fill it with all these things. But it, it never scratches that itch. And I'm telling you this. This is what it is. You need to know the love of your Heavenly Father. You need to know the love of Jesus. All of us are born with that need, with that desire inside of us. Um, I may say some things that you don't want to hear. Okay? I'm sorry. I apologize, but I want you to know where I'm coming from. If I do... I'm not saying things to hurt you on purpose, and I'm not judging you or condemning you, okay? I want you to know. It's, it's not who I am. I, I probably wore every single letter in LGBTQ at one point in my life or another. A little bit of my background. I was born. Um, my earliest memories, I, I had this compass in me, and I always knew that I was female. My, my personality, my dreams, my aspirations, my... My compass, you know, they, they, we all have a compass inside of us that sort of shows us our path, you know, our integrity, how, how to be an authentic, real person, the person God made us to be. And my compass always pointed to female. That was true north for my compass. And I could turn around and walk in a different direction. I could walk in the direction of male, but just like, you know, how a compass spins around and keeps pointing to true north, no matter which direction you walk in, that was my compass. 
And no matter how many times I walked in the direction of male, it always pointed to female. But um, when I was five, I had surgery on my urogenital area. And um, I had issues like control of my bladder and growing up. But I, I was basically raised as a boy. And I tried really hard to be that boy. I wanted to please my parents so bad. Um, I wanted to fit in. But you know, it was always unnatural. Something that I, I couldn't do. And, um, look, along the way, some bad things happened to me. I was molested by some teenage boys and a 45-year-old woman. And sure, that scarred me and shaped who I am. But it it wasn't the source of, you know, I'm, I'm sure it confused things and messed things up and mixed things up, but it wasn't the source of my identity. Um, my, my father was a, a very violent alcoholic, almost killed my mother twice. Mom says I saved her life one time. I came downstairs and he was on top of her and we ran and, you know, he used to beat the snot out of me and my sister. Um, so I am sure that these experiences weighed on my development. But, and, and I know that many of you can identify, okay? Not all of you, but many of you have grown up with abusive fathers and mothers or neglectful fathers and mothers or no fathers and mothers at all. A lot of you have been sexually abused and bullied and hated and despised throughout your life and outcast. And I want you to know, Jesus is just telling you tonight, he gets it, he gets you. He, he's literally walked miles in your shoes, okay? They hated him for no reason. It was nothing that he did. They just hated him for who he was. The Lamb of God. You know, you know that feeling, right? You walk in a room. You haven't done anything mean to anybody. You, you bend over backwards as hard as you can to try to be sweet and kind. And win people's friendship and their respect and their love. And no matter how hard you try. Have you ever felt just hated sometimes because of what you are and who you are? And not even anything that you did? I know you felt that way. LGBTQ person. Well, I'm here to tell you that Jesus has felt that way. He's walked miles in your shoes. Okay, so look, I lived a very promiscuous and sexually immoral life. Did a lot of things I wasn't proud of, a whorish life. I talk about it in other videos, but I'm trying to save time, so I won't go into details now. If you want, you can watch his other videos. And I ended up getting into an ungodly relationship with a particular woman. We had sexual relations outside of marriage, um, outside of God's plan, sinful sexual relations. And uh, But I wanted family and, and, you know, it brought with it obligation and guilt and, and feelings of suicide. I, I tried to get out of the relationship several times and, you know, she she would threaten to commit suicide. And, and here's the thing about sexual sin, you know, we, we all... At least a lot of us want to believe that there is such a thing as casual sex, but there's no such thing as casual sex. Um, sex is it's like a spider's web, okay? When it's done outside of God's plan, when it's done in a way that is sinful, it, it tangles you up like a spider's web. It wraps you up and entangles you. and it, it can affect you the rest of your life. It can suck you into relationships that you should never be in. You know, it can, it can do things to you and scar you. Not to mention even things like, you know, there's STDs and things. And I'm, I'm just saying there are lasting repercussions. And there really is no such thing as casual sex. But, um, but I want you to know tonight, God is not singling you out, you know? A lot of heterosexual people, they think they have a get out of hell free card. And they're going to be shocked on the day of their judgment. Um, you know, statistics and figures say that LGBTQ people are less than 5% of the population. So think about this. 95% of the straight heterosexual population, the population that's not LGBTQ, the, 90, the other 95%, a lot of them are going to bust hell wide open. So even though you have felt singled out all your life, even though you've gone in, in churches and you've heard people get up and preach and say, God will damn America because of your son, because of you, 5% of the population, um, and yet, you know, I, I know you felt anger and indignation at the hypocrisy in many churches because you look around and you see people, you know, doing things that God hates, getting divorced and committing adultery and fornicating. And, and Florida, we've even had pastors 
hire contract killers against each other. You know, murder and, and <laughs> there's murder, there's child molesting, you know, there's wife beating, there's there's all these you know, racism and prejudice, there's all these horrible sins in the church, you know, in the name of Christ they want to burn a cross on your yard and, and do all these horrible things. I, I, I know you have seen so much hypocrisy and we're going to talk about that. And I hope you learn a few, a few things tonight. I hope you can carry a few things with you, things for you to think about. But, but you know, in spite of all that, I, I want you to know that God is, is not singling you out. He, there is such a thing as sin, and we have to repent of it. But God is not unjust, and he doesn't, he doesn't hate you. He doesn't love you less than he loves a straight person or a heterosexual person, even though some of you have had that beat into your skulls all your life. Not at all. He loves you so much. He loves you so much and he's calling to you. And, and I'm going to say some things tonight that, frankly, I don't think you'll be expecting to hear. Things you might not have ever heard before. We're going to talk about them. Truth is stranger than fiction. So I'm not going to necessarily tell you what you want to hear, but I'm also going to tell you some things that might just blow you away. Well, I don't know. I'm going to try my best to speak the truth in love, okay? Very, I promise you, promise you, I'll try my best to speak the truth in love. Anyway, I finished my background. That sexual sin entangled me and I got married. And I stayed married to that woman for 23 years and I tried so hard to be the husband, the man in the relationship. Every day pretending to be something that I wasn't and I was miserable. But you know what I mean? I was loyal. I was faithful. I never cheated on her, but it was pure hell. For her and for me some days. Just, you know, I wasn't who she wanted, who she needed, and and I hated being that person. I looked in the mirror and I couldn't stand who I was, you know? This fake, icky person that I just didn't want to be. I never have been. I'm oozing with rainbows and butterflies, and, and I was trying to act butch, you know? And I was trying to, act, I mean, I'm full of sugar and spice and sometimes piss and vinegar, but, but still, you know, I... You can only, you can't maintain a relationship if you can't be yourself, if you can't be real. If you have to pretend to be something that you're not, you're doomed to fail, right? Because it, it takes constant energy and it just wears you out and exhausts you. When every day, every moment, you have to constantly pretend to be somebody that you're not. And in spite of all that, I failed miserably after 23 years. She left me. She told me, hey, I, you know, I want a divorce. I'm tired of feeling like I'm married to another woman. I feel like a lesbian. I'm tired of competing to be the wife. As hard as I tried to be the husband, I guess it still bled through somehow. But <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was devastated at first. This is four and a half years ago. I haven't even dated since then. But honestly, that was the start of coming back to God in my life. That was the start of repentance. Of That was the start of me truly falling in love with Jesus Christ and and realizing that I thought I knew God before, but I did not know God at all. I thought I loved God before. I did not love God at all. I thought I had a relationship with God. I did not have a relationship. I thought I was saved. I, I don't even think I was saved. If, if I don't know. All I can say is what I thought was the end of me, what made me suicidal and want to die was actually the beginning of life for me. Okay? And she went on to find a soulmate, married a butch bodybuilder, he was butch and macho and masculine and everything she ever wanted. And I'm just single, you know? I'm, I don't give my body to a man. I don't give my body to a woman. I like to come before Jesus and worship and I give my body to him as a living sacrifice. And I say, Jesus, here I am, you know? And for me, it's like a virgin bride on her wedding night that would offer her body to her husband and say, here you go. I feel like I'm saving myself. I, I found the most beautiful, romantic, intimate love for Jesus, you know? He fulfills me. I, I never knew what it felt like to be loved until I knew what it felt like to be loved as, as a woman, as a female personality, as, as a sister, you know? When I started making friends and people started loving me and you know, women loved me as their peer and calling me sister and all, I don't know if you can relate or not, but you know, I told you, all my life I'd be in a room full of people and I felt like I was an invisible girl. I never felt loved. And, and now all of a sudden, all these people are in my life and they're relating to me as, you know, soul sister at least. 
Or even if I'm a freak of nature, they call me sister out of kindness and love. They relate to me. They love me that way as a peer, as an equal. And I feel so loved because of it. And Jesus is like that, you know. I'm finally in a relationship where I get to be the bride. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, he's the husband. If you look in scripture, a whole other video I have to do on that, you know, the bride and, and the bridegroom. But we are the bride of Christ. He's the groom. Okay, we're the wife, he's the husband. That's scriptural, it's all throughout the Bible. Again, it'd take me hours to go through all the scripture. That sound, might sound weird to you. Check out some of my other videos. I talk about it. So I won't talk about it now, but... Okay, the point is, is that... I am, I've never known so much joy and happiness. I, I live a single life. I live a sexually pure life. And I have never known so much happiness and joy and acceptance and love and warmth in my life as I do now. Okay? Um, and I'm still me. I'm still authentic. I believe I've finally become the person that God wants me to be. The person who's fearfully and wonderfully made, the scripture says. The person he had in mind when he made me. And I'm here to tell you with a message tonight that we're not all created to be the same. You know, God makes some of us different. We don't all fit the molds of male and female. We're going to talk about that. And not only that, some of us are called to live single lives. We don't need to be in a relationship. We're going to talk about that. Um, but I, I wanted you to know where I come from. I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. But I will tell you the truth. Because I love you. I am not here to flatter you. I'm not here to say things that... I'm here to tell you the truth. But I'm here to say it in love. Okay? So, um, let's get started. I'm going to approach this from two separate angles, um, a biblical angle and a spiritual angle. We can lump those two together and a biological uh, or a scientific angle, okay? So if you'll bear with me, it might take some time, but I, I hope it's worth your while. I just want to give you some things that maybe you never thought about. I hope you never thought about. I'm going to approach this from two separate angles. Um, a biblical angle and a spiritual angle, we can lump those two together, and a biological uh, or a scientific angle, okay? So if you'll bear with me, it might take some time, but I, I hope it's worth your while. I just want to give you some things that maybe you never thought about. I hope you never thought about. Okay, so first, let's see what the Bible has to say um, about sexuality, about gender, orientation, all the things that we argue about and non-stop and disagree on, but, um, and I don't know how I did that. Looks like I made some. Okay. All right. So Genesis 5, 1 through 2, and this is, this is sort of the beginning of the controversy. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. And I've heard so many people take this verse, rip it out of context, add their own words to it, and use it to build a dogma and an ideology that it was never intended to create, you know? I mean, I'm sorry, but we were warned in Revelation 20 to 18 not to add to the Word of God. And here's the thing. It does not say that male and female is all God made. It does not say that He made male and female and nothing exists outside of that and all of creation. Because if you look, and we're gonna we're gonna look at the animal kingdom, there are so many different animals that exist outside of it. We're gonna look at human beings. One in 1,500 of us are born outside of male and female. Jewish Talmudic law, rabbinical law, has provisions for those who are born outside of male and female, okay? There are so many exceptions to this rule. And we try to oversimplify. We want to take the Bible, we wanna thump it, beat somebody on the head with it, Make up a dogma, make up some tradition of man, and, 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 and act as though it were God's word when it's not God's word at all. So, first off, you have to stop adding things to scripture that aren't there. Okay, you have to stop using that to support your doctrines and your dogma and your own personal theology. Throw your own personal theology in the garbage and go with what the Bible says and nothing but what the Bible says, okay? He created the male and female, okay? So yes, he made male and female, but that's all that states. 
Stop adding to that. Now keep that in the back of your mind. Let's move on. All right. Okay. So that that's been used a lot in this debate over whether or not you know. It, it, it's it, it's been used to condemn a lot of people. So take that into account. Take it at face value. Don't add anything to it. Don't take away from it, but don't add to it. Okay, what about David and Jonathan and Ruth and Naomi? These are two situations in the Bible that a lot of people say justify homosexuality. And what I want to say first is we have a hard time understanding their relationship because our society is so depraved. We have become so corrupt and so depraved and so over-sexualized, we no longer understand that it's possible to have an intimate, maybe even like a romantic relationship with someone. And you hear people say bromance and they joke about it. But I'm being serious. To to love someone deeply and intimately and affectionately, like, like you would hug on them and lean up against them on their breast and cuddle with them, but it's a non-sexual kind of love. I'm going to prove to you that that exists in the Bible and that it's normal. I'm going to prove to you that we're the ones who are perverts. We're the ones who have forgotten that that kind of love is possible. All right? There is a kind of love you could have for someone of the same gender or the opposite gender. Where it's, it's non-sexual, but you kiss and you hug and you cuddle and, and you taste each other's tears. Okay? It's, it is possible. We've just lost sight of that in our society. Our society is so corrupt. What am I talking about? David and Jonathan. 2 Samuel 126, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Okay? So, a lot of people use this and say, well, see, then the Bible says David's a man after God's own heart, and they say, well, David was gay, and Jonathan was gay, and they had a homosexual relationship. But that's not true. We just don't get it. We don't, we don't actually understand the amazing love that they're talking about a non-sexual love, and yet, yes, truthfully, it is a love greater than the kind of love a man would have for a woman. That's possible, but it was a non-sexual love. And that makes it even greater, okay? It doesn't detract from it. We're not, we're not trying to take, we're not trying to delegitimize the love that two men can have for each other. We're actually elevating that love. We're saying that it was so powerful and so pure and so holy and so amazing. You know, if you read the story, when David and Jonathan saw each other, they wept with tears. They would run to each other and they would kiss each other and hug each other and embrace and just hold each other tenderly, affectionately. But it was impurity. We just don't think that's possible because our society is so depraved. We've lost, you know, we... Isn't that just like sin? Like, 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 like Satan tantalizes you with the sin that glitters and glows. And you take it and you think you're getting something good, but you're actually giving up something even better for it. You can have the kind of love that David and Jonathan have for people of your same gender. And it can be pure love and affectionate love. But we have to get our heart in the right place. And Auntie says, how I weep for you, my brother Jonathan, oh, how much I loved you. And your love for me was deep, deeper than the love of women. Okay? So, um, and then Romans 16, 16 says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All right? So, that was a very common practice. That was cultural back then. You know, it doesn't matter if you guys or gals, same gender, opposite gender, whatever. In between genders, you greet one another with a holy kiss. It was just a greeting. People were very affectionate. John 13, 23, I want you to see this. There was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Some versions say his breast, his bosom, okay? One of his disciples. Okay, so basically they were cuddling. All right, they were cuddling, whom Jesus loved. There was a client on Jesus' bosom, on his breast, against his chest, one of his disciples, and listening to his heartbeat. How intimate is that? Two men, and that was an intimate. They, they were basically cuddling. They were being intimate, but it was... It was totally pure. There's nothing sexual about it. I'm, I'm trying to get you to open your eyes and open your mind. Um, and you know, you might get this more than... I mean, there's a lot of straight people who are going to be guffawing and, and hating on this. You know? Because their minds aren't pure enough to get it. 
There, there, it, this, this makes a straight person's mind go in the gutter. <laughs> but you know what? There's one more verse we need to look at. That's Titus 1.15. If that makes your mind go in the gutter, be you straight or gay, heterosexual or homosexual, the Bible says this, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. That's something to think about. All right, let's look at some other things the Bible says. Ezekiel 16, 49. You know, you, know, you guys walk in churches and you hear them preach about sodomy and sodomites and the evil sodomites and blah, blah, blah. And God's going to judge America and damn America because of Sodom and sodomites and sodomy and blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, while they're thumping their Bibles, have they ever read the actual recording in Ezekiel? That, the actual sin that Ezekiel recorded against Sodom? Because, you, no, they don't. They talk about Lot. And they talk about the angels and, and, and what went on there, which, which was horrendous and horrible. But that's because basically they were wanting to rape these angels. And, you know, and, and, and that was double detestable back then because it was, it was like a double breach of honor. You know, you, you just, you didn't do that to strangers. You were supposed to take strangers in as your guests and shelter them. Okay? Whole different situation. But, but the actual sin recorded against Sodom, they never preach on this. I bet you haven't heard it. Ezekiel 16, 49, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She had, and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. So that's a sodomite. That's a sodomite. Okay, the real sin of sodomy, that's a sodomite. You know what? Straight, there's lots of straight heterosexual people that are sodomites. Truth. There's lots of straight heterosexual people in churches. They go to church every time the doors are open. And they are sodomites. Ooh, big news. According to the Word of God. Who are you going to believe? Word of God or, you know, Ezekiel 16, 49. Right there. Right there. Right there. You know anybody who's arrogant and prideful and overfed and unconcerned? They don't care about anybody but themselves? You know anybody who doesn't help the poor and needy? Well, that's a sodomite. Boom. So, maybe it's not what you thought. Leviticus 20.13, now this, this is in the Bible. If a man has sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death, their blood will be on their own heads. Leviticus 18.22 says, do not have sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, that is detestable. You know, I was actually looking for scriptures about lesbians. I didn't find any until I got the Romans, which is weird, but... but Aside from the point, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer, the man, and the adulteress, the woman, are to be put to death. So why the double standard? A, because they would always put the adulteress to death, but they hardly ever stoned the man. And we're, when they brought the adulteress before Jesus, and Jesus set us an example that we're supposed to defend those who people are condemning and trying to stone, and help them get free of their sin, not join with them, throwing rocks at them. But, but notice that it was just the woman that they had. They didn't have the man. Double standard. Also a double standard because, you know, a lot of people, they think homosexuality is an unforgivable sin. But they have no problem forgiving preacher after preacher after preacher, Christian after Christian after Christian, caught in the act of adultery. I have literally been in churches where it was like a 60s wife swap. I mean, the spouses sleeping with each other. I've been involved in religious organizations where the clergy, the, the, the people in charge were molesting their own children and beating their wives and just horrible, horrible things. I'm sure you've all seen it. Rampant sin in the ranks of the church. So why the double standard? We're going to talk about that. There's a reason. I have a conspiracy theory about why there's a double standard. Anyone who dishonors father or mother must be put to death. Such a person is guilty of a capital offense, right? All of these are sins for which, according to Leviticus, Levitical Old Testament law, one should be put to death. How many of us have dishonored our mother and father? Said a bad word, a profane word to them. How many of us have committed fornication or adultery or sexual sin outside of God's plan, outside of marriage? How many of us have broken one of the Ten Commandments? Well, I guess we're all sinners, aren't we? And yet some of us want to look down on others because their sins are different. Oh. 
<sighs> um, I found an interesting quote on Yahoo. The Leviticus passage is part of a long ritual purity passage along with the shellfish ban, adultery, and other rules that Christians freely ignore. Jesus was extremely specific in his speech against divorce, but evangelical Christians have the highest rate of divorce in the U.S. That was an actual answer I found on Yahoo. I feel shame because of that, you know? We want to point the finger at LGBTQ people. We want to say God's going to damn America because of us. And yet the Word of God tells us judgment begins with the house of God. And there are only 5% of the population. The 95%, the heterosexual straight people who don't struggle with same-sex attractions, they have different sins, they're busting hell wide open. Why don't we care about them? Why don't we obsess over them? What, their sins aren't sensational enough for us to gossip and talk about? And oogle over? Hmm. Is it that maybe, you know, if we want to feel good about ourselves, and, you know, it's, it's much easier to look at someone else who struggles with a sin that we have no temptation for, a sin we don't struggle with, same-sex attraction or whatever. It's really easy to look at them and condemn them and then use that to make us feel good about ourselves and, and to ignore and not have to face the sins in our own lives, you know? And that's fake holiness. When your holiness consists of the fact that you look down on other people and that makes you feel superior and you feel good because... Your sin isn't the same as their sin? Oh, we're going to talk about that. Jesus called the Pharisees on that. That's fake holiness. Real holiness is when you stop looking at all the other people whose sins are different from yours, and you look in the mirror of God's word, and you see your own sin, and you come to him in tears, and you repent, and you say, Jesus, whatever that sin is, forgive me, wash me in the blood of the Lamb, set me free. That's real holiness. Holiness is obeying the words of Jesus in red. Loving your enemies, blessing those who curse you, praying for those who use you, humbling yourself as a child, constantly forgiving, being meek, being merciful instead of rendering sacrifice. All those words in red Jesus spoke, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty. That's walking in true holiness. But having a feeling of superiority because you're not like some other group of people, that is not, that is, that is a lie from the pit of hell. If you believe that as holiness, you are in danger of dying in your sin. Jesus said, tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of heaven ahead of the Pharisees. So true. Why? Because the Pharisees, they don't repent. They, their fake holiness makes them falsely feel they're superior. Because you know, they're not like that tax collector, that sinner, that publican, that homosexual, that drug addict, whatever. And they don't repent. And they're in danger of dying in their sin. But tax collectors and prostitutes, when they come to God, they come in tears, weeping, repenting, rending their hearts and saying, God, be merciful to me. Talk about that some more. Romans 1, 22 to 27 talks about some LGBTQ folks. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools and exchanged the glory of a mortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Their women, even their women, exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves to do penalty for their error. Okay? That certainly covers gay and lesbian, the G and the L and LGBT and every other letter. It covers straight people too. Heterosexuals and fornication and adultery and all kinds of sins outside of God's plan. But what I want to say to you, LGBTQ person, is God has not singled you out. Oh no. If that is the message that you received, that is the message that you heard, that you walked away with, you walked away believing a lie. Someone lied to you. Someone condemned you when they shouldn't have. Someone didn't tell you the truth or they spoke the truth to you, but they didn't, they didn't do it in love. They didn't give you the whole truth. And so I'm here to do that tonight. It's going to take me a long time. Oh my goodness. It's going to be longer than an hour, I guess. There's so much to cover. But if you'll give me your patience, I promise I'll give you some things 
to think about for the rest of your life. I promise I'll give you some things that might just set you free. If you'll just give me the time, if you just give me the chance. We all know this in Luke 18, the parable that Jesus told about two people who prayed. But I'm going to read it just to remind us. So Luke 18, starting in verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. And isn't that just like many of the churches today? Full of people who practice a fake holiness. Their holiness consists only of the fact that they look down on others. And because their sin is different, they feel superior and they feel justified. They are not truly repentant people. They have not truly repented of their own sin or even understood their own sin. Their pride, their jealousy, their gossip, the coldness of their heart, their hatred or their bigotry or their lust, whatever it might be. It's a condition of the church today, isn't it? But you know what? Just because there's a counterfeit doesn't mean there's not a real thing. Just because you see a hypocrite doesn't mean that there aren't real, true children of God out there. Just because someone sold you a fake Jesus doesn't mean there's not a real one. So I'm continuing. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee. Let's call that person, you know, the church lady or church person. And the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Okay, so basically the Pharisee, he's just bragging to God about how good he is. And you know, I actually hear people do that in church. They get up and they pray, and it's like a fake false humility. And it's like, oh God, oh God, thank you that, you know, you're so merciful to me that, you know, uh, I did all these good things for you in your name. And and, and I did, you know, come on, you, you can tell, you can tell. You know what I'm saying? When somebody's fake, when they're phony, you can tell. You just feel it, especially if you're a feeler or you're empathic. I mean, you know, come on, we feel those vibrations from miles away. So that person had fake holiness. But Jesus said the tax collector, prostitute, homosexual, lesbian, whoever you want to put in there, stood at a distance, would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, the sinner, right? Rather than the other, the church person, when I'm justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. What was the difference? The tax collector knew how to repent, and the Pharisee didn't. Okay? God calls all of us to repentance. An LGBTQ person, if you know that you're not perfect, if you know there are things in your life that you need to get right with God, if you are sensitive to his spirit and, and you you are closer to the kingdom of God than the straightest, most squeaky clean church person who goes to church every time the doors are open, but yet they feel like they're okay and they don't ever examine their own heart and repent of their own sin. You're closer to God than they are. That's what Jesus said. I didn't make it up. I want you to think about this in Matthew 19:12. Jesus is talking to people and he says, here's something just to think about. I'm throwing this out there, okay? I know we all struggle with different temptations and things, but not all of us were actually even intended to be in a relationship. Some of us were created with the capacity to be joyful and happy being single, to exist outside of a relationship. And we don't have to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or fiance or husband or wife or or, or whatever. Not all of us fit neatly in the gender lines of male or female, in the extreme black and white molds that we've colored that are fake, that are false, that because there are shades of gray all in between the male and the female. You know? People get so dogmatic. And rather than read the Word of God and change what they think according to the Word of God and let it open their mind and, and help them realize that, you know, life isn't as simple as we think it is. Some things are complicated, and you have to have the Holy Spirit to work through it, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's not always a hard, fast answer for everything. But rather than see that, they would rather warp and twist the Bible to have an oversimplified 
dogmatic, man-made view. They, they want to twist the Bible to support their personal prejudices. Because for whatever reason, it's just easier for them to grasp it with their mind or, you know, I don't know, who knows. But truth, truth is stranger than fiction. And that's how you should approach reading the Bible. With an open heart and an open mind. Take it at face value. And Jesus is right here in Matthew 19, 12. Some of us are born outside those male and female, you know, molds, those lines. Some of us are different. Okay? And that's okay. Some eunuchs are born that way. We're going to talk about that, the biology. Some eunuchs have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Those who can accept this should accept it. That's what Jesus said. So keep all this in the back of your mind. I want to take a break in a minute. We're going to come back and we're going to go full on, full steam on the biology, the science, and the spiritual and, and scriptural part of this. But I'm, I'm, just hold this, buffer this in the back of your brain. Just remember that the Bible says these things, okay? Let this get into your spirit. Let this word sit inside you and percolate. Put it in a pot on the stove and let it simmer. And while it's cooking, we're going to start some other dishes in this meal that we're making. All right? We're not just cooking one thing here. We're cooking multiple dishes, okay? Keep that there. Okay, I want you to also realize this. There are gender benders in the Bible, Okay? There's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.28. Matthew 23.37. Right, so, so neither male nor female. Meditate on that. Say that. Matthew 23.37, Jesus says, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stand there sent to you. I often long to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you are not willing. Why does Jesus use... A feminine reference there. A hen, a mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings. All right? Think about that. He wasn't so afraid of expressing his femininity or his feminine side or what we might call that. And people get offended if you, you know, we have this weird idea in our culture that anything feminine or female is, is sinful and anything masculine must be, you know, more worthy, more righteous, more, it's, why? We read up at the top in Genesis 5, God made them male and female. It was good. Female's good too. And the Bible says in Isaiah 54 verse 5 that our maker is our husband. And verse 6, it calls us a wife of God. We're the bride of Christ in Revelation 19 too. I mean, this is poking holes. If you have bigoted, dogmatic, concrete rules and ideas, man-made traditions about male and female, the Bible is going to blow them away. It's, going to sh it's like a machine gun. It's going to riddle them full of holes with the bullets of God's Word tonight. Um, if you'll let it into your heart and you'll let go of that, that man-made tradition that you believed all your life, that man-made dogma, if you just look at the Word of God with an open heart and an open mind, open eyes. Isaiah 49, 15, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she is born? That she may forget, I will not forget you. God's feminine side. Hmm. Um, Numbers 11, 12, Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldst Say unto me, Carry thee in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land, uh, which thou swearest unto their fathers. Okay? Huh? Nursing fathers? What's all these gender benders in scripture? Let's not forget Deborah the prophetess, who held a traditionally male office, but we won't even go into that. Alright, um. Let's look at a few things here. There's actually something called male lactation. This is kind of a tangent, but look, there's a method to my madness. I'm trying to show you a point. You believe all these things that aren't true. You don't look at the science of it. You don't look at the Scientific American article. Males can lactate. Some males do, all right? It's 
there's plenty of historical cases um, in history where males have actually, you know, something would happen, you know, in the absence of, of women to nurse children and things. And um, it's weird, maybe. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, 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 but I'm just trying to make a point. I'm trying to shatter. I'm trying to be iconoclastic. I'm trying to shatter this graven image that we've made of gender, okay? And let's rebuild it in God's image. Sorry, I had to get something to drink. <laughs> Whew, this is taking a lot longer than I thought, but again, if you'll be patient, maybe it will be worth your while. I hope so. Okay, so we've laid down sort of a basic foundation of scripture. I've explained to you a little bit about my background and that God has a message for you. Can you hold that in the back of your mind? I'm going to talk about some weird things. But, um, so male lactation, and, and the Bible has this thing about nursing fathers, fathers giving suck to their children. You know, people are so judgmental against LGBTQ people. They're, their universe is so threatened, their dogma, their personal dogma, their prejudice is so threatened that I, I even came across one lady who had a conspiracy theory that this proves the Mandela effect. According to her conspiracy theory, you know, the Mandela effect is basically like that, you know, somehow history and our timeline is being rewritten by certain events and things, or history is being erased. And so she claims that was never in the Bible, and that somebody went and then changed it and then added that to the Bible and something. And I don't know, it just, it's ridiculous. But I just thought that was kind of a, a humorous. So, so she is literally so firmly entrenched in her dogma that rather than believe a verse of scripture, and rather than believe science in front of her, she comes up with an elaborate conspiracy theory that, that all of history has been changed and our timeline's been changed. And interesting. I have a conspiracy theory of my own. You know, Milo Yiannopoulos, the, the you know, darling token right-wing gay poster child for the right. I think my personal conspiracy theory is that he is a plant by the right. Um, you know, he starts advocating pedophilia and it's, it's funny how he portrays all of the bigoted fears that people have against LGBTQ people. And I know that you've been demonized. A lot of you, you know, they think of you as unfit mothers and unfit fathers and child molesters and pedophiles. And their view of you, a lot of religious people have a view of you, you know, like what they see on the Folsom Street affair, which is depraved. Granted, it's depraved, but no more so than a heterosexual sex show that you go to where they have all manner of, you know, pornography and porn stars and things. And, um, but unfortunately, I, I, I realize you guys get stigmatized. They don't see the side of you that I see. A lot of, you have to realize that, okay? They don't, they've been sold a bill of goods and a lot of them don't even realize it. Um, they don't realize a lot of you are single moms and single dads working hard just to feed your kids. They don't realize that a lot of you provide loving homes and loving families for people. They don't know the loyalty and the faithfulness that you exhibit in your friendships. You know, how you keep, literally have kept some of your friends from killing themselves. How you've been there for your sisters when they were down and out. And you've been there for your brothers when they were down and out. They don't see that side of you. They frankly don't see you as human. They, 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 they have a less than human view of you. They see you, this dark shadow figure of, of, you know, but I want you to know that's not how God sees you. And I want you to know that's not how a true child of God will see you. Because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit and a true child of God will always make them treat you like a human being. Will always, even if they don't agree with your lifestyle, they will show you kindness and they will show you love. They will show you respect and they will treat you like a human being. They're never going to treat you like you're not worth something, if they have the true spirit of God in them. I want you to know that. Love is the litmus paper of a true follower of Jesus. Just as so we're supposed to love our enemies, bless those who curse us, pray for those who use us. So if they don't love you, they're not real. Don't you walk away thinking that all Christians are like that person if they're fake. Don't you walk away thinking that's God. If they don't have love, they're not from God, okay? We're going to speak the truth tonight, but I hope you can speak the truth in love. So,
Oh, yeah, okay. So, you know, you have to understand there's, there's a tremendous double standard. And there's lots of theories for it. We'll talk about it. But um, let's look at one of the points we need to discuss here. LGBT folks, you, you're marginalized, ostracized, despised, and rejected by many. Look at the suicide rates, okay? You can bring up some of these. This is just some, some basic research that I went over. But some, in some instances, some groups, like for people that are transgendered, 44%, okay? 44%. Um, different groups, 20%, 40 But you could roughly say that close to half of many LGBT people have struggled with suicide. So, um... Maybe there are plenty of you that are happy, and, and, and you know, that's, that's great, but the truth be told, there's a lot of anguish, there's a lot of brokenness, there's a lot of despair, there's a lot of dark times that you go through, and God knows that. He wants you to know. He sees you in those times. He wants you to know He's loved you in all those times. His heart is so tender for you. I just wish I, wish I could make you feel his love for you. So yeah, the, the suicide rate is, is very high. I'm trying to save time, but, you know, just looking at some of the gay and trans people murdered, I mean, you know, people have their eyes gouged out. Some people have been burned alive, doused in gasoline and set on fire just for, just for walking down the street. Literally, I was at McDonald's with my adopted daughter, Maya, and, and uh, met these two homeless gay people. Right? His name was Johnny, and his boyfriend's name was Chris. And he came up to me, and his, I noticed his face was all beat up, and his eyes were swollen, and I said, what happened? He said he was just walking down the street, and some good old boys on a pickup truck came by, called him faggot and queer, and, and beat him so bad. He spent three days in the hospital, and his, his eye was still swollen shut, and his face was all just puffed out, and, you know, messed up his jaw, knocked his teeth out, just because he was walking down the street holding hands with his boyfriend, Chris. There's no excuse for that. That is never the will of God. That, you know, those people were not Christians. I, I, I don't know what kinds of cruelty you experience. But I can tell you this. Those people who did that, if they don't repent, they think they're superior because they're not gay. They will burn in hell for that hatred. For that hatred, they, they will literally, if they don't repent of that sin, what they did to that man, to Johnny, they will burn in hell for that sin. God can forgive them. But here's the problem. They don't think they're wrong. Those good old boys in that pickup truck, they feel like they're righteous for what they did. So what are the chances they're ever going to repent? Unfortunately for them, very slim if they don't ever feel like they did anything wrong. Again, Jesus said you're closer to heaven than they are. Listen up, LGBT person. So I'm talking to him. And he's hungry. We're at McDonald's, so get him some Big Macs. He takes him, goes up, brings him, brings him to his, his boyfriend Chris, and we start praying. And, and, and God, I thought I could pray with him while he's eating. And, and God, let me know, he let me feel that Johnny had been terribly abused by his dad. Something we had in common, you know. I, just, I could sense it somehow. And uh, I told you that's how God communicates with me, so I could feel his feelings of. You know, what his dad did to him growing up. And, and I, I, in the prayer, I started praying. I'm like, God, I thank you that you're a gentle and kind and sweet and loving father. Gentle and, and forgiving and kind. And you're not abusive and cruel and violent and mean like, like an earthly father. And, and Johnny just started crying. Tears coming out of his eyes. And his boyfriend Chris was crying. Yeah. Yeah. I get it, you know. Sometimes people, you're just, sometimes you're hated and despised just for being who you are. Wow. Well, let's look at percentages of the population here. I'm not going to worry about trans murders and gay murders. You, 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 if you're an LGBT person, you, you know how it is. You know you got to look over your shoulder sometimes. You know there are people out there that they just, they will kill you as soon as look at you. They hate you not for what you do. You didn't do anything mean to them. You didn't do anything to make them your enemy. They just hate you because of what you are. And that's okay, you know. 
you actually have something in common with a lot of children of God and, and followers of Christ because Jesus said they would hate us just because we're his children, because we follow him. Jesus said they will hate us because we remind them of him. So you actually have something in common. You have an experience in common with true children of God because true children of God that live an uncompromising life for Christ, they are hated and they are despised by the world. The world doesn't love true Christians. Jesus said they would hate us because they hated him. So we have a common bond. All right, we, we, there's common ground. Um, but any, in, in this case, for the demographics, look, uh, some estimate, the highest estimates are a little bit over 5%. All right, so we're talking, we are about basically 5% of the population, right? statistically, scientifically. So if that's so, why is it that Christians and conservative organizations spend an inordinate amount of time obsessing over LGBT people? Why do they like to talk about us so much? Ever wonder about that? Crazy, huh? Hang on, I gotta wet my whistle. I smell a rat. You smell a rat? Again, if we're only 5%, and the straight population is 95%, doesn't that mean that the greatest percentage of people that are going to bust hell wide open are straight people? So proportionally, why don't the churches spend 95% of the time addressing the sins and temptations of non-LGBT people? Hmm. Makes you wonder. Maybe it's that they like talking about sins that they don't struggle with. I don't know. Maybe it guarantees you won't offend anyone and so you keep the money coming in the offering plates? I don't know. You tell me. What's your conspiracy theory? Let's take a look at this hatred in the name of Christ. So you're only 5% of the population, but you do get a disproportionate share of the hate. I know that. I sense that. All right, so let's see. Hatred in the name of Christ. The Daily Grind. This is the Pulse Club shooting massacre that happened last year. I live in Daytona, about an hour, hour and 20 minutes from Orlando. So it's actually pretty close to where it happened. So this preacher, Christian pastor, is preaching, there's 50 less pedophiles in the world. And by the way, you know that we're mothers and uh, daughters and just all kinds of people who died in that massacre. But, you know, whatever. So yeah, there are preachers literally preaching, you know, you know, they're, they're, very callous and unkind when that happened. And I know you've seen this. I know you've been exposed to this. I know this has tainted your perception of God and your perception of Jesus. And I'm here to apologize and say that I'm sorry. I'm here to tell you these people are fake. This guy here, screaming off this kind of judgment without love, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna call it like I see it. He doesn't have the spirit of God. No, that's not Jesus. I don't see Jesus picking up rocks to throw them at the adulteress. I see Jesus getting between the Pharisees and the adulteress and defending her. I don't see the spirit of God in him. I see the spirit of the Pharisees in him. You know, Satan's the accuser of the brethren. And that's the spirit that I find in that person. You tell me. I don't see the spirit of Christ in that. Not at all. Let's look at some more hate in the name of God. I'm just going to bring up this article here. Baptist preacher in Atlanta says it's safer now because all those people were killed. And so there's another preacher preaching and teaching the same thing. It's just horrible that more people didn't die and that God didn't eat. And he's saying gay people should be executed. Masquerading gays should be executed. Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, if you're back to the Old Testament, Children should be executed for dishonoring their parents. That sure happens a lot. But there sure is a lot of adultery and divorce in the church. And that's a capital offense, punishable by death. Just saying. So I get it. You have been singled out. You have been unfairly singled out. These hypocrites, these people who are unable to look at the sin in their own life 
and they only want to look at the sin in your life, I get it, and I'm sorry. Please, please forgive the church for what we've done. Forgive what people have done in the name of Jesus. And I'm here to tell you tonight, that's not the real Jesus. That's not the real God. All right? They're just Pharisees 2.0. Go read Matthew chapter 23. Look at all those things. The most vicious things Jesus ever said were to the Pharisees. And they were people just like those people. And Jesus tore them anew and he cut them to pieces. He, he said, you travel over land and sea to make a single convert. And when you do, they become twice as much a child of hell as you are. He said, you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You won't go in, nor will you let others enter in. He said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You know, he called them a brood of vipers and said they're whitewashed tombs on the outside all clean and white, but inside full of filth and dead men's butts. Jesus had so many vicious things to say about them in Matthew 23. That's all they are. You don't believe them. So you see the Pulse Club shooting. You see all this. and you know, Christians are preaching that, well, God deserved, you know, they deserved it. And they died, you know, they deserved to die in their sin and blah, blah, blah. And, okay, so we get to the Las Vegas shooting. And uh, different group of people here. But about the same number died. Maybe a few more died in the Las Vegas shooting. Some of these same people, you know, they say, oh gosh, you, Pat Robertson, as a matter of fact, we'll, we'll get to that. Pat Robertson said that he believed that happened because people were disrespectful of, of Donald Trump or whatever. How hooky is that? So, so people die, people, LGBT people die in a mass shooting and they deserve to die and burn in hell because they're LGBT people. And yet people go to, they're in Las Vegas, which is known as Sun City, but because they're perceived as being heterosexual or straight, truth be told, I'm sure there's a good number of LGBT people in that crowd too, but I'm just saying, because their sins are perceived as something different, you know, but then, then there's a whole different conspiracy theory about, you know, well, they didn't deserve to die. And the only reason they died is, I mean, I, I get it. I'm trying to validate you, okay? I'm trying to say, I know why you feel like running from God. I know why you don't want to darken the doors of your church. I know why you get all clammy and want to put your walls up every time somebody tries to share the word of God with you. I'm here to acknowledge you. I'm here to apologize. I'm here to say, I'm, I'm, th this is what God wants to say to you, okay? He wants to get all that out of the way. All the garbage that they've done in his name. He wants to clear it away. So he can talk to you. And so I'm just trying to acknowledge you right now. Ridiculous hysteria and rampages, all right, for trans people. I don't even identify as that, but, you know, hey, I've, been, I've worn that hat too. Trans woman woman goes on rampage, warns of devil rape at Target. Yeah, this lady goes to Target with her Bible, screaming at the top of her lungs, the devil's going to rape your children because, you know, some trans woman who totally looks like a woman wanted to use the bathroom and... How stupid is that? Think about this. They've been doing it for 40 years and nobody even knew. And all of a sudden it becomes a hotbed political issue. And again, again, it's, it's like the cup and balls thing, you know? Look over here. Don't look at your own sin. Don't pay attention to the depravity of your own life. But go look over there at something that you make up, that you trump up, that you... I get it. And yet some, you know, some people are afraid to use a public restroom. They can't find a safe place to go pee. They're afraid of getting harassed or beat up or raped or... No. I get it. God gets it. They don't. A lot of them are full of hate and they can't see past their own nose. They're so full of bigotry and so full of prejudice they can't see past their own nose. Okay, but don't judge God on them. Alright? That's what God's trying to tell you tonight. Horrible crimes taking place. Um, I'm not gonna, show, these articles are horrible. I was gonna show them to you, I'm gonna try to save time, but mother cooks her two sons alive in Atlanta. Mother decapitates her own baby. I mean, these are demonic. As far as I'm concerned, mother eats part of her child's head. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's like demon possession going on here. This is like, this is like crazy stuff here. But yet, you make the news more than they do. <laughs> 
you are the topic of fascination more than than things like this. Sure, I, I, I get it. Okay, you've seen hypocritical Christian leaders. I don't like to name names, but hey, this guy's already out in the open. He, he rose to power on a platform of preaching against sexual immorality, which is good, but he crusaded against LGBT people and talked about how horrible you know, the gay community was, and yet they found him with a male prostitute smoking crack in a hotel room. I know you've seen the hypocrisy of leaders like this. I know you've felt the outrage. I know you've walked away from the church in disgust, saying, how can they, they sit there and they beat me down with the Bible because my sin isn't the same as theirs. And then some of them are committing the exact same sins. And some of you were open about it. You, at least you don't hide it. At least you're, you know, you're out of the closet and you're, I mean, it's even worse to me when people do it in secret and then they preach against it. How hypocritical is that? And you saw that and I'm sorry, I apologize. I, this guy was the leader of the Evangelical Association. So many of you think that's God. Many of you associate God and Christianity with, with Ted Haggard. But I'm here to tell you that that's not God. Um, And of course, you know, every pastor who falls, they'll forgive and they'll restore. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't. But why is it that you are the scarlet letter? Why is it that they hold you at arm's length and you're, you're the person that they don't want to welcome into the fold? I get it, LGBT person. I get it. So much hypocrisy. Jimmy Swagger, you remember the Jimmy Swagger? He got caught with a prostitute and... You know, these people, they, they make their living thumping the Bible, literally taking the Bible and using it as it was never intended. The Bible was intended to build God's kingdom. And they take the Bible and they use it to build their kingdom. You know, money and power. And, and they use it to beat people down. They use it as a sword. And the sword was meant to fight the devil and his demons, the enemy. It was never meant to beat down the misfits and the outcasts and the rejects. So I apologize for that, you know? That sword was intended for an entirely different purpose and it's been abused. The word of God has been abused. And you have seen nothing but hypocrisy. Oh my gosh, Pat Robertson, look. Oh, I'm gonna make some people mad, but. All right, justifying Trump here. Trump brags about grabbing women's vaginas, and he says, well, he's just being much of I'm, I'm not going to play the video, but, but look, you you see it like I see it. You see the hypocrisy. On, on the one hand, they can justify everything this guy does. On the other hand, they wouldn't give you the time of day. Um, you know, Pat Robertson's personal theory that disrespect for Donald Trump caused the Las Vegas shooting. Wow. Just, just craziness, craziness, craziness. The thing is, there's a counterfeit gospel being preached. It makes televangelists rich, and uh, it doesn't, it's, the gospel was intended to be preached to the poor, the outcasts and misfits, people like you, like, like the LGBT community. And it's not, Instead, it's, it's been, been twisted and warped into something to make a few people rich, to build their kingdom instead of God's kingdom. And frankly, they focus on you because you're sensational. You scratch what their itching ears want to hear. They don't want to hear about things that convict them, that get them to live a holy life and repent of the sin that is in their heart. They'd rather hear about something sensational, about something that tantalizes their itching ears in the... It's not just a conspiracy theory. There's some truth. This, this guy's not a Christian. So I take what he says with a grain of salt, but if you felt singled out, I'm here to validate you and tell you that there's truth to it. You have been singled out. Uh, and this comes from a former person that was inside the 700 Club, and it shows you a lot about the character of who Pat Robertson really is. Now, speaking with writer Tara Isabella Burton for Vox, former 700 Club producer Terry Heaton explain the culture that surrounded the popular televangelist TV show as it grew to prominence in the 1980s and 1990s. Now, according to this former producer, who had just written a book, 
the gospel of the self, how Jesus joined the GOP, he had a religious awakening during the period of the 80s and 90s. Um, but that his newfound Christian beliefs did not always jive with the, version, with the vision of Pat Robertson. Now, he began explaining his reason for writing that book. Now, I find this very interesting. He said, I wrote the book because I felt I needed to apologize for my role and what we have in front of us today. Now, wait a minute. So the whole purpose was, I, I felt bad. I mean, I, I felt like I needed to apologize because I was a part of this thing, this thing that we created uh, with Pat Robertson, or that thing being the 700 Club with Pat Robertson. Now, he also said, I don't necessarily feel guilty about it, but I just want to get on the record that I participated in something that has turned out to be pretty bad. And of course, since the show was not really about the Bible, well, they ended up having to cover other things. And again, that was an admission that it's not really about what's in the Bible because he flagrantly ignored that in order to make more money. So to cover up for that, they instead went to, well, you guessed it, sex. They went to sex. Now, uh, he says, quote, it turns out that abortion, gays and lesbians, and birth control, they're all about sex. Sex, more than everything else, scares people who want their children to be safe and to live in a sanctified world. I don't want to overstate that, but it's the truth. And not only did they focus on fear and sex, or fear of sex, or sex and fear, right? They also pushed Republican Party talking points. He said what we gave them was Republican Party politics. We had an explanation for all their fears, and it was the lack of personal responsibility. Big government, people trying to take from you what really belongs to you, which again, I think is basically built on fear, uh, and the whole worldview he summed up in two words. Self-responsibility, self-responsibility, self-responsibility. He said all those things worked very well with the type of Christianity we were preaching. And look what they preached. That would have worked very well with the Republican Party. And it worked very well for certain politicians. And it worked very well for televangelists. Okay, well, so just to sort of validate, um, again, the fact that, you know, you are singled out by a lot of ministries just because you're sensational. You know, it's, it's sort of that scratching what people's itching ears want to hear. Um, and also, to be fair, mixing politics with the kingdom of God is idolatry. That is the worship of an idol. That is a grievous sin that God will call folks to account for. Mixing politics with the word of God, the kingdom of God, two separate things. Um, so, my LGBTQ person, my friend, I just want you to know. I want you. I want you to be validated, okay? Oh, and there's people out there. Oh, there's many uncursing people that speak against his ministry. Okay, you know, actually, Jesus cursed a fig tree. And you can curse things like cancer tumors and, you know, but I don't feel like we have liberty in Christ. I feel God, I feel like, I feel God's heart on this. I feel like we are speaking presumptuously if we think we can curse people. Okay, witches do that. But children of God, Christians, no. I'm sorry, we have standing orders from the commander-in-chief. Jesus is our commander. And we have standing orders from him to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to pray for those who use us. If someone slaps us on one cheek, to turn the other cheek. The church grew by the blood and on the backs of the martyrs, those who were put to death for their faith and, and never denied Christ. And said, Father, forgive them. They know what, the, what they do. And they love their enemies right up to their very last breath. And 
now I'm supposed to believe that it's okay for us to go around cursing people in the name of God. What happened to Christianity? What happened to the words of Jesus? What happened to the gospel? What is this abomination, this fake counterfeit that people claim as Christianity? But it's Christianity without any Christ in it. There's no Christ in their Christianity. So LGBT person, don't you believe it? Okay, let's look at some biological, scientific things. Um, you know, there's lots of states between perfect male and female. We're not all dealt equal cards in life. Right, we're not all born the same. We're not all born just male or just female. So, disorders in sex development. This is a Rochester study. Um, excuse me. Talking about how um, reproductive organs form and what can go wrong. Girl baby with too much male hormones. Who seems to have a small penis. A boy baby who has a normally small penis or what looks like a female clitoris, blah, blah, blah. Because it's atypical female genitalia or male genitalia, pseudo-hermaphroditism, and true hermaphroditism. Um, you know, read up on this, all right? But it's all there online, if you look for it. Um, there is, you know, there are plenty of situations where people are born and, you know, things go wrong, okay? Gender-wise, physically, mentally, um, hormone imbalances. I talk about this in other videos. You know, surges in testosterone or estrogen when the mother's pregnant in the amniotic fluid can cause a female baby to masculinize her brain and her body, or a male baby to feminize his brain and his body. You 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 do have situations, okay, where you can not only be born with ambiguous genitalia. Um, or both, or neither, uh, but you have sit situations where you can have the brain structure of a female in the body of a male, or the brain structure of a male in the body of a female. This is, you know, this is anathema to too many Christians. They don't want to admit it. It violates their sense of religious dogma. Um, and believe it or not, even some non-religious people do. Scientifically, the truth is out there. If you'll look for an LGBT person, there are biological factors. You know, you, you've been lied to and told all your life it was something in your head. No, it's not. Um, there are so many disorders out there. You can have uh, two X chromosomes or XXY. There's not just XX and XY, there's Klein filters, androgen insensitivity syndrome. Um, Man born with their genitals had his gender confirmed 24. You guys didn't even know what gender he was until 25 years later. All right, when they actually you know measured him, and, um, this was him. Male or female birth defects affect one in 1,500 births. Okay, that's actually conservative by many estimates. Um, male or female babies born on the sliding sex scale. It's actually increasing in frequency because a lot of plastics in our environment mimic hormones like estrogen and pesticides mimic things like testosterone. Um, but if you'll read through some of these articles and just pause the video and you can follow the links if you like. I'm sorry I didn't have time, but if I get a chance I'll try to copy and paste them down and put them under the video where you can read them for yourself. But 4% of babies born with gender birth defects, okay? So, 4%, 4 it's, although that's still not common, it's a lot more common than people think it is, okay? There are major defects. And interesting, about 5% of the population is LGBT, and about 4% of the population is born with gender defects. So, hmm, you know? So a lot of these are visible in terms of Klein filters or androgen insensitivity syndrome, people born intersexed with both parts, hermaphroditism, um, people born with no genitalia at all, um, malformed genitalia, okay. A lot of it's outwardly visible, but I don't believe all of it is outwardly visible. I think a lot of it can be internal. It can involve, you know, your brain structure. 
and um, there's ample science to indicate that. There's a movement now. You know, doctors are moving away. When someone was born under six, they used to want to cut the extra parts off, and they're not always sure they make the right decision, though. A lot of you may have experienced that. And, you know, you've been raised as one gender all your life, but you always knew there's something wrong. There's something going on in the back of your mind. It's like, why? You know what? What's going on here? Um, androgen insensitivity syndrome. Um, most people have one X chromosome, one Y chromosome, but these people don't respond to androgens like testosterone. So they can be born male, but they look female. Their bodies look, you know, they have vaginas and breasts, and they can't have children, but but chromosomally they're male XY, but their bodies look like a normal female's body. You wouldn't know if you were in a locker room with them. You'd be thinking that's just a normal woman. They have a vagina, they you know urethra, the breasts, and everything. Primary, externally, the the same characteristics, sex characters as a, as a woman, but they're chromosomally X Y. Okay, so you can have situations like that. Kleinfelter syndrome. Um, let's go to the Mayo Clinic article here. Okay. Um, all right. So in this case, again, you have people that you know, can be born male, but they have female sex characteristics. They actually have an extra uh, X chromosome. So they're like a woman, but with a Y chromosome mutation thrown in there. So they're double X like a normal woman. But then there's a Y just to kind of screw or mess things up and. Uh, you know, 4%, 1 in 1,500 births. So it's not as uncommon as you might think. True hermaphroditism, um, there are actually cases of that. You know, some people are born with like part of an ovary, part of a testy, or um, you have pseudo hermaphroditism here. I'm trying to, look, I'm, I'm throwing all this out. I know I'm going through it really quick. This isn't a documentary about I'm, I'm just trying to show you, there's a biological basis why a lot of you are not born like your sisters or your brothers. You're not, okay? But it's not all in your head. Don't you believe the lie and the garbage that people have told you all your life that makes you want to commit suicide and kill yourself because they tell you there's nothing wrong with you and that it's all in your head and it's just a choice and you're like, if this was a choice, why would I, you know, why would I choose to live a life like this where people have... I, I'm just, I'm validating you, okay? I'm validating you. I'm telling you that you're not crazy. I'm telling you that a lot of you were born different. A lot of you were formed different in your mother's womb, okay? Um, and there are biological reasons for the things that you struggle with and, and, and for what you are. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to live a life of sexual purity. It doesn't change God's standard, but God wants you to know that you know, he, he gets it. He sees the big picture, even when people don't. When people are judgmental and, and bigoted and they don't see the big picture, he does, okay? Um, estrogen environment from plastics. Um, this is interesting, you know, this is screwing up a lot of babies and feminizing a lot of males and, and pesticides also act as androgens and they masculinize a lot of uh, uh, masculinized females. So there, there's so many things in our, our environment that wreak havoc with our hormones in, in birth today. Um, born in between, intersex individuals, people that are you know born with both parts. Um, again, a movement not to operate on intersex babies because they make the wrong decisions plenty of times. You know, they chop off the wrong parts and raise a baby as a girl when it should be a boy, or they raise a baby as a boy when it should be a girl, whatever. Um, Intersexed individuals among us. There's a little Wikipedia article of it. Um, and these are all people with bits and pieces of earth. I'll take a look at those faces. A lot of them, you wouldn't even know. They just look like normal men, normal women. You wouldn't know they were intersexed, you know? Appearances can be deceiving. How quickly and ignorantly we judge people without knowledge, without understanding, without any I'm just here to tell you tonight, God's not like that. God, God knows. God understands, okay? Even if they don't, 
Even if, even if they'll, they never get it and they don't love you enough and they don't care enough to do the research and arm themselves with the facts and actually get rid of their ignorance and get real scientific understanding of, of the issues that you deal with, it doesn't matter because God knows. God loves you. Um, uh, from a spiritual biblical perspective, think about this. Um, all right, if and I was I was reading some rabbinical texts and Talmudic texts, you know, from from uh, the Jewish faith. And what was Adam before Eve's? You know, we're told in Genesis that God took a. I gotta hang on. Sorry, this is gross. I know, but I can't stand it. Sorry. Sorry, you had to watch that. <laughs> but look. We are told that God took an, a rib from Adam and made Eve with it. Okay, so what was Adam before Eve? Adam had in his body the genetic composition of male and female. So was Adam a hermaphrodite? Was he inter intersex? Um, instead of having 23 chromosomes, did he have 46 chromosomes? And then God split those in half? I mean, that's the belief of, in you know several rabbinical texts. So Adam was sort of the prototype, the proto-human from which you got Adam and Eve, from which you derived male and female. But before that, so again, there are states, even in religion, even biblically, that exist outside of male and female, or that transcend, or exist between male and female. Okay? Something to think about. Um, and then there are several texts I was reading. There's rabbinical law. There's even provision in Jewish rabbinical law, you know, the rabbis, that um, basically make provision for someone to, when they're born intersexed, or they're born, you know, and their gender is mixed up and messed up and confused, they're giving the, the right to choose the gender that they want to live by. And once they choose that gender, they have to stick with it, and they have to live by the rules and the regulations, and they have to, you know, do what is righteous, or... In other words, if, if, if okay, if their gender is messed up and they're born and, and they choose to live as a woman, then they have to live as an honorable, godly woman, all right? They, have, they can't be a promiscuous woman or, and if they choose to live as a man, they have to live as an honorable, godly man. But the point is, is that they give them the choice. They don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater or condemn them. And a lot of them choose never to marry. They choose never to, you know, take a mate to themselves. and. You know, God can give you the ability to be happy when you're single. And I'm not saying God, you know, it's, we each work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And God, who knows, maybe God, maybe there's a soulmate for you out there. I'm, I'm just saying, this is something to pray about. Something to, something for you, I want you to understand that God, that God sees the big picture. He's not judging you. I want you to understand you're not crazy, that there's biological reasons for what we are it's, it's it's nature and nurture but there's definitely a huge nature component and i know that dogmatic religious dogmatic religious people have denied that to you all your life a, a lot of them you know they they won't even acknowledge that you you know they act like it's a choice it's like you know they don't treat blind people that way that are born blind they don't treat deaf people that way. They're born deaf, you know. They don't. They don't. But there's there's definitely a, a double standard there. Sure, you know God God sees that, and God's reaching out to you tonight, and He's telling you, I get you, and I love you. Animals born in nature. Um, it's funny. I, I hear people, you know, the Bible thumpers. They get their Bibles and they start trying to like quote science that they don't even understand, or biology that they've never even researched. And talk about, well, God didn't make that in nature. And yet you look in nature and you find it all over nature. <laughs> so um, I'm not even going through all these articles that I spent days and days and days researching. Because this video is going to be like an hour and a half. It's already going to be way too long. I didn't want to make a documentary movie. But unfortunately, it just ended up being that long. But look, there are animals, species of animals that go through... Um, Everything from like you know chickens and birds and clownfish and uh, moray eels and wrasses and I believe even a bearded dragon, that they can be born male and and become female or female and, and become male. All right, they change their gender in the course of their life. 
Um, their gender is not hard or fixed. You find examples of this in nature, in God's creation. Okay? The bearded dragon, I'm just some of these animals, the clownfish, and thinking of finding Nemo. And who knew that, you know, who was it? Was it Marley, Marvin, who was, I don't remember who the, per, the fish's name was, and, but anyway, who knew? <laughs> Hermaphrodite animals. Animals with both, all right? Worms and fish and echinoderms and snails and stuff. And, you know, plants are both male and female. And So look, all throughout creation, you have animals who are both, animals who are neither, or animals who are born one gender to become another. That's nature. That is God's creation. That is nature. That is God's plan, God's design. Not sinful, not wrong. Okay? So there's a difference between what you are and what you do. And I'm trying to get you to understand this, that you may not be able to help what you are. There are nature, biological reasons why you are what you are. Brain-wise, body-wise, whatever rainbow spectrum of LGBTQ you fall in. But that doesn't have to dictate what you do. Just because you are different doesn't mean that you have to live a sexually immoral life. Okay? You can still make a choice to live a sexually pure life. You can still have closeness and intimacy with God. You know, you don't have to be hoochie. Just because you're different doesn't mean you gotta just, you know, it's like it's like Satan comes to us and, you know, because we feel, we're made to feel like we're freaks. We're made to feel like we don't feel we're misfits. It's that there's no hope for us. God's, no, not even God himself will accept you or love you. And so the thing, the thought in the back of our mind is, well, what the heck, why don't we just go out and just live like a, you know, live the most sexually or moral life we can live and, and have sex with anything that moves because there's no hope for us. It's it's almost like we just give up. And and God's telling you tonight, no. No. Don't give up. It's not a death, something that's not... Just because you're different, it's not even something you need to be ashamed of. You know? You are fearfully and wonderfully made, even if you're not like your sisters or your brothers, even if you're born different. And God says, you know what? I'm only being fair. I'm not singling you out. I'm just telling you that I love you just as much as I love a normal person who's normal, you know, in the whatever, gender, male, female, or their sexual orientation, or whatever, their brain, and body, sex, and gender, and, okay, he loves, he loves you just as much as he loves the normal people. And he's telling you that he has the same standard for you that he has for them. His standard for them is that they live a life of sexual purity, okay? And if they don't, that's sin. And it separates them from God. And the standard is the same for you and me, okay? That's that's what he wants to say. And one of the things he, he wants to say, gender altering animals, and they've done studies on the brain scans of trans people, and, and, you saw, and look, there are brain differences in gender here. I'm just, I'm trying to make you Feel like you're not crazy. I'm trying to make you understand that there's nature, there's biology involved in this. And I, brain scans show trans people feeling at odds with their body, right? And this person, you know, they were born, you know, as far as I know, they weren't even born intersex. I think they were born in a supposedly normal female body, but they felt male. And look, I mean, I'm not getting into uh, semantics. I, I, I disagree with the surgery respect our aspect of it simply because it seems like a terrible waste of, of money and time. And it seems terribly self-centered, you know? When you have to raise children or there are people starving to death in the world and you go spend fifty, hundred thousand dollars on what amounts to cosmetic plastic surgery. Okay, look, I get it that it helps you fit in. And I know the desire you have to want to fit in. And I don't judge it, I don't blame you for doing things like that. But it's, to me, it's no different than a woman who neglects her children to get a boob job, all right, or to get a facelift. It's, I'm not saying that it's sin, but it's, it's vanity. It's total vanity. Uh, it, it amounts to just basically cosmetic plastic surgery. And let me tell you something. I never needed surgery to be complete and whole. All I ever needed was Jesus Christ, and I just needed to be able to live my life authentically. I just needed to stop being the invisible girl. 
Maybe you need that. Stop being the invisible boy, girl, whatever you are. Um, I just needed to know what it felt like to be loved. For being myself and not having to pretend to be something that I'm not all the time. I'm never going to be as pretty as my sisters. I'm never going to have all the parts they have. I'm never going to have all the parts my brothers have either. <laughs> I'm not going to be like them ever. But, you know, I found my niche, my niche, my little... I found my place and where I belong, in the family of God, you know? People call me sister and soul sister, and they love me like that, as a sister in, a, in the family of God, and that's all I ever really wanted in life, you know? It's really, I'm, I'm, I've never felt so loved by God, by others. I'm just trying to validate you. I don't know what your solution is. You know, you've got your own compass. It's different from mine. You have to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's different from mine. But I'm just trying to get you to think. Again, I don't know what letter you are, but, you know, have you ever thought maybe surgery is not what you need? Maybe what you just need is love and acceptance? Maybe just what you need is, is the freedom to be your true self, your authentic self, to be loved for who you are and not have to pretend to be something and someone that you're not? To have somebody not judge you for not being born like everyone else around you. I'm, I'm just trying to get you to think, okay? Um, oh, check science, being trans is not a choice, blah, blah, blah. And it isn't. There's so much scientific evidence. and Oh, my gosh. You hear people with their lame brain, crazy... You know, but look, I mean, I've, I've researched this in Scientific American. I've researched this for years. And let me tell you, there are biological nature reasons. I don't, you know, I don't even get why people are so obsessed with trying to prove that this is not biological. What do they get out of it? What are the 95%? They don't have to live the life that you live. They don't have to, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're so condescending and they can be so judgmental. And yet... They don't even struggle with what you struggle with. How would they know? Unless they walk 10 miles in your shoes, how would they know? I, I don't understand. Because I don't think if you cover something up and if you deny it, you're never going to be free from it. It's all in your head. No, really. And it is in your head. It's genders in your brain. It's not always based on your body. This is another study just showing that it's, you know, the whole LGBT spectrum. There's a nature side to it. There's a biological side to it. Do you understand? I'm validating you. I'm validating you. I'm telling you that you're not crazy. Um, there are so many birth defects that happen. Um, an interesting video, you know, we all start out as female. Um, and then our parts differentiate into male parts. And I talk about this in other videos. And this is a video, I'm going to play it on YouTube. All right, I'm gonna play it for us real quick. So, here, let's go ahead and play this video. This guy explains it probably way better than I could. Even the though the male variant of the. Okay, so let's. Dear gentlemen, science has a confession. Your life actually began as a female. Well, phenotypically or physically speaking, that is, though some prefer to call this stage gender neutral. As you might know, when two people mate, they each combine half of their genetic information together, 23 chromosomes each. One pair of these chromosomes helps to determine your sex. If you're female, you contain two X chromosomes, one from your mother and one from your father, while males have one X and one Y chromosome. At the moment of conception, you were, of course, male or female based on your genes, but the Y chromosome doesn't kick in right away. In fact, the first five to six weeks of embryonic development are attributed to the X chromosome alone, and females grow from embryo to fully developed through the influence of only the X chromosome. So what does the Y chromosome do? Once activated, one of the genes on the Y chromosome, known as the SRY gene, has two functions, to inhibit certain features of the X chromosome and to impose through dominance the physiological traits that a male must have. The ovaries descend and become the testes and the labia fuses to create the scrotum. If you're a male, take a look. Though it's more pronounced in some men than others, you'll likely notice a line or ridge of tissue on the scrotum, which is called the scrotal raphe. The skin of the scrotum and penis are zipped up like a zipper as the layers of cells develop in the embryo. And the male variant of the clitoris? Yep, 
that's the penis. If the Y chromosome does not become activated for some reason, then the female phenotype or physical appearance will persist in a male. While we're at it, this is also part of the reason males have nipples. The nipples form before the activation of the Y chromosome and SRY gene and thus remain through development and life. But you don't develop breasts. Sorry. Got a burning question you want answered? Ask it in the comments or on Facebook and Twitter. And subscribe for more weekly Okay, so again, hopefully that's a little bit more revelation. This is from uh, Men's Health magazine. And again, it's, it's Men's Health, but they're talking about um, three signs you started as a girl and your nipples and you know, different body parts. And again, they're, they're talking about the same thing here, okay? So we have, we have such an extreme mold of male and female we try to shove everybody into. But it's artificial. I'm trying to shatter this lie. I'm trying to be iconoclastic and break this lie. And I hope when I do that it will set you free. I'm not telling you you can go live a sexually immoral life. I'm calling you. I'm calling you. The, the voice of the Lord wants to call out to you. To call you to repentance. Repent from living a sexually immoral life. Okay? There's no such thing as casual sex. And we, we know their consequences. Look, I lived a life of one night stands and I, I was trapped in a way of thinking. I was always looking for love, but trying to use less to get it. And I know there's a lot of us are trapped in that cycle. I mean, I thought if I gave someone an orgasm and you know, I mean, I got good at it. I listened to their breathing and their muscle contractions and that, you know, they would love me, but it, it never worked out that way. What I really wanted was pure love. No strings attached. I wanted holy love. And that kind of love I, I found in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. He set me free. He showed me the difference between lust and love, okay? And love is the thing that I wanted. That's what filled the emptiness in me. That's what really made me happy. It wasn't lust. It wasn't one night stands and taking the walk of shame the next day. Come on, can we be frank? Can we be honest? A lot of times you go to the club, you're not looking for a one night stand. You just want somebody to accept you. You just want to feel loved. You just want friendship. You just don't want to be alone. Can't you admit that's true? Man will start out as female, blah, 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 blah. Okay, look, there's all kinds of... I don't even go over half the research I put together for this video, and I'm sure it's going to be way too long. If you're still watching, I'm impressed, because I would have gone to sleep on me by now. But, uh, <laughs> uh, LGBT person. I have plenty of other videos that touch on different aspects of the subject, but look, I'm just telling you. You don't have to be like them. You don't have to be a Stepford wife. You don't have to fit their mold. You be the you that you were born to be, that God created you to be. God didn't make us all to be the same. You know, God doesn't make us all fit a certain mold. He shatters the mold after he creates every single one of us. We're intended to be unique, authentic individuals, unlike any who came before us or any who will come after us. God's not going to, God doesn't want you to live your life in a prison cell according to someone else's expectations about what you should be as the perfect female or the perfect male, there is no such thing. There are so many things that can go wrong in biology, in nature, and in nurture. I'm only here to tell you this. The call of God goes out to you. He loves you. And you will never know real, true love the way you can and knowing God, he, he is the truest, most real, most authentic, most wonderful kind of love who fills that empty place inside you. That itch that you can never seem to scratch. That's hunger for God. That's, that's a desire to be loved, which you can only get from your Heavenly Father. Some of you might have been called to live a single life. And who knows, maybe God... Maybe God may change the way you think someday. I don't know. But I'm not going to promise you that. 
I'm not going to sell Jesus to you like snake oil or a used car salesman. And I'm not going to tell you it's all in your head or deny that your issues aren't real. They are. All I'm saying is, it's the same standard for everyone. We're called to live a sexually pure life. And God can help you with that. God can set you free. He can set you free, my friend. He loves you. He can set you free. Whether you're straight or gay, whether you're LGBTQ, straight, gay, bi, whatever, whatever there is, hetero, homo, how many labels are there? I hate labels. Labels are just stupid, but, you know, just, just, sin is just sin. It doesn't matter how you go at it. Look, in a lot of ways, you guys are closer to God than people who go to church every time the doors are open. Because if you can at least realize that you need God, you're far closer to Him than religious people who, you know, they they darken the doors of a church every time the doors are open, but they don't know. They don't repent. They don't. I'm just telling you this. I have never known so much peace, so much joy, so much love, so much warmth in my life. I am less lonely now. I haven't dated in four and a half years, and I am less lonely now than I have ever been in my entire life. Even married to the wrong person and constantly every day pretending to be someone and something that I wasn't, you would think I wouldn't have been lonely, but I felt lonely. And I'm sure she did too. It's like sleeping next to a stranger and I had to get right with God. I had to get some things out in the open. I had to confess some things. I had to get them under the blood. I had to I have never felt so alive. Every day I wake up, I'm ready. Every day at night I go to sleep on my pillow. I know if I don't wake up the next day, I'll wake up in heaven in the arms of Jesus. I have so much peace. I have so much security. I feel so loved. I have sisters and brothers, and they, they love me, and it's pure. You know, we, we hug, and, and, and we cuddle, and we tell each other we love each other, and it's and it's holy and it's pure. It's like David and Jonathan, you know? It's, it's even better than sexual love or romantic love, but it's pure and it's holy, like Titus 1.15. It's like Naomi and Ruth kind of love. The real thing. And you know, think about this. You're missing out on something even better. If, if you give in to sexual immorality, if you let it taint your life, you're missing out on the most intimate, most holy, most pure love you could share with other human beings. Like David and Jonathan, like Naomi and Ruth, like, like Jesus and the disciple who laid his head against his breast and listened to his heartbeat. When you can walk in purity, there's a beautiful kind of love that you can only know when God sets you free from from a life of sexual immorality. And nobody's singling you out and no one's judging you because this applies to heteros and homos. This applies to straight as well as gay. You understand? There's no double standard with God. There's just one standard. He loves you just as much as anybody else. Matter of fact, he has a special burden on his heart for you. He sees how tender you are. He sees how rejected you've been, and his heart is very, very tender, very broken, because he himself was rejected. He's calling out to you. Do you want to know him? He's coming back soon, and if, if you want to know him, all you got to do is ask him into your heart. My LGBT sister, my LGBT brother, will you pray this prayer with me, please? Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, Lord. Forgive me for the things I've done that hurt you. Forgive me for the things I've done that hurt others. Forgive me for the things I've done that hurt myself. Heavenly Father, I forgive right now in the name of Jesus. I forgive everyone who has wronged me. Because according to your word, 
I have to forgive others so that you can forgive me. I release, I let go of every pain that they cause me, every grudge I hold, the anger, the bitterness, the pain that I relive day after day, the bullying, the abuse. God, I, I release it and I let go of it. Wash it away from me. And Jesus, wash me in, in your blood. Take my sins away. I want to be pure again. I want to be innocent again like when I was a child. Before my innocence was taken from me. I want to be like I was a virgin again. Lord. Jesus, thank you for making me new. For making me pure. For giving me a second chance. Thank you for giving my innocence back to me, Lord. Jesus, come into my heart and be my best friend, my companion, my soulmate. Lord, your word says we're the bride of Christ and you are our groom, our husband, our spiritual husband. Be my spiritual husband and let me be your bride. Walk with me every day. Be my very best friend, my soulmate, my companion, my closest friend. Teach me your way and your word and your will. God, help me to live a sexually pure life, a life that pleases you. God, help me to be authentic and real and genuine. I don't need to fit anyone else's mold, but the mold that you made for me. Just teach me how to be the best me that I can be, Lord. Teach me how to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I bring people into my life Christian sisters, Christian brothers, to help me along the way, to help me grow, so that I won't be alone, so that I can fellowship with them and grow stronger. God, prepare me. Prepare me for your return. Thank you, Father, for your kindness and your mercy. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. LGBT person, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. The real family of God. Not the fake one. Not the Christian version of Mean Girls cliques. Not the Christian version of Steel Magnolias or country clubs. or No, I mean the real family of God. You pray and he'll bring real sisters and real brothers to you. And they will love you for who you are. They won't judge you. They won't condemn you. They'll just help you grow. And they'll help you get free. When you stumble and fall, they're not going to kick you when you're down. They're going to they're gonna put their arms around you and they're going to love on you. And they're going to help you get back up and try again. That's what a real child of God is like. Maybe you never met one, but they're out there. You just keep looking. You'll find them. Welcome to the family of God. I'm glad to be your sister soul. <laughs> you can talk to me, you know, Facebook, email, whatever. But God will send you sisters and brothers right where you are. If you pray and ask Him. And you hold on. My sister, my brother, you hold on. Because Jesus says He's coming back. He's going to take us home to be with Him. So we'll be entering those pearly gates pretty soon. The rapture is happening. Talk about that in other videos too. Don't have time to discuss it in this one. I went way too long. But this was all for you. This is just for you. Because God loves you so much. He has so much love in his heart for you. He has so many tears he's cried for you. He has longed for you so much to come to him. And he feels so bad that so many of his servants would not deliver his message. And they would not carry his love to you. So he used a crazy, squirrely, messed up, freak of nature like me. A ditzy airhead. He had me bring this message to you tonight. So that you could see that it's him and not me. He wants you to know that he loves you. This is all for you.
He's coming back soon.